Well, good evening. Welcome to the uh, t- Toolbox. We are um, in week six of this class called The Story of Scripture, Understanding the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we've gone five weeks and actually just made it through the first five books of the Bible. So uh, the Pentateuch, um, the Torah, you know, the, the Law of Moses, the Words of Moses. So um, you might be thinking, wow, if we're only doing this in 12 or 13 weeks, how are we going to get through the other 61 books? But we're going to start moving a little bit more rapidly. So those first five books, the Pentateuch, um, they really set the stage. We need to understand those. They're foundational to understanding the, the entirety of Scripture from that point forward. But as I said, we're going to start moving a little bit quicker um, moving forward. And again, I want you to understand that in all of these, I mean, we, we could spend weeks and weeks on every single book in the Bible. So we are just highlighting some of the things. I would encourage you to read along, to, to read the story of Scripture. But we're just highlighting um, some of the things that are going to help us in this overall narrative as we understand God's promises and his plan revealed to us um, through the scriptures. So again, week six that we're starting on today, got a couple of objectives you can follow along in the notes. Um, Also in the notes, I put another quiz, quiz number two. Um, So the answers will be at the end. You can can take that on your own and and, um, just see again. I I would guess that, that hopefully if you followed along that you've learned a whole lot more than maybe what you even realize when you go back and look and see. So um, a couple of objectives um, for this week. And um, uh, one is, is the first objective is we want to understand the Davidic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the covenant of David. So we've talked about the Abrahamic covenant. We've talked about the Mosaic covenant. We're going to get into another one this evening. So we want to understand what that is comprised of, the Davidic covenant. And then also we want to recognize our need for God's true king. Um, to see what he's starting to do. We're going to get glimpses of this um, this evening. And again, we, we get the advantage of seeing all of Scripture, and we know where it's headed, but um, I think it'll give us a greater appreciation of who Jesus is and what he's done for us as we see how this unfolded, this plan unfolded um, that we get in the Bible. So quick review, um, again, is just um, we want to go over the 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. So 5, 12, 5, 5, 12, we've got the Pentateuch. Um, we've got history, we've got poetry, the major prophets, and the minor prophets. So the, the first part, the Pentateuch and history, is, is pretty much a chronological um, history of, of the nation of Israel, you know, biblical history. And remember, as the author writes, as the different authors write under the inspiration of God, they were doing something with what they wrote. So they weren't just giving us a history book, they were taking us somewhere. So If we took those last three sections we've talked about, poetry, major prophets, minor prophets, if we could put our arms around those and pick them up, we would drop them down into the history section, which we'll start seeing over the next weeks how that all works out. So there's your Old Testament. I would challenge you to memorize the books of the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. So 5, 12, 5, 5, 12, then we move to the New Testament, 4, 1, 21, 1. So we've got the Gospels, we've got the history section, which is the book of Acts. We've got the letters um, written by the apostles to us that, te- that, that teach us what to believe and, and how we are to live that out. And then we've got the book of prophecy, Revelation. So again, encourage you to memorize those 27. As you do, as you get more and more familiar, your confidence will grow as we see how this whole story fits together. So, so those are those things. Then where we're at now, just a quick review of the Pentateuch. We saw in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 how God created. He's the creator God. There's one God like no other. The people were coming out, uh, as Moses wrote to them, they were coming out of the nation of of Egypt. Um, So there was a lot of of pagan ideas. There were multiple gods. And and Moses writes to us through the inspiration of God that there's one God, and he's the creator. And it gives us this idea of creation and peace, um, protection. There's no sin or no death. We've used the term in those first two chapters, shalom. So everything was the way that it was supposed to be. Then we know the story in, in chapter 3, we, we got the fall, and where there is sin, there is death. And, and now we have this huge sin problem, and there's absolutely nothing that we can do about it. So our hope lies in the fact that there is a God, a creator God, a covenant God, that can actually take matter in, in matters into his own hands, and he can do something about the problem that we have. And that's really the idea of Scripture in the 66 books we have. We then saw how that sin spread and infected the whole world, and and God made a promise and a covenant to a man named Abraham. We saw that in in Genesis chapter 12 about a a people, a land, and and a worldwide blessing. And then for the rest of Genesis, we kind of traced the lineage of of Abraham all the way down um, to Joseph. Then the book of Exodus was really a coming out 
uh, Moses comes onto the scene and the people are, are taken out of Egypt and they're led towards the promised land. And, and in that we get the Ten Commandments and really the Exodus is, is a law for the land as God's preparing for the people to enter into the land that he had promised them in Genesis chapter 12. So there's Exodus. So then when we got to Leviticus, it was, it was really laws um, for the priest, for the tribe of Levi. And there were all kinds of, of, of sacrificial system, a sacrificial system was, was put into place. And, and really that was a, a living lesson for the people that they understood that we serve a holy God. And where there is sin is there is death. There, there needs to be um, a sacrifice to cover that over. So we saw the laws and regulations for those priests in that tribe. Then in the book of Numbers, we, we really talked about two census um, that were taken. One was the, the group of people that, that God took out of Egypt, that first generation, and his plan was to bring them into, into the promised land. But they chose uh, fear, and so God said, okay, because of that, you're going and not trusting in me, um, you're going to, to take another lap, we said. And so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation died out. Then we moved into um, Deuteronomy, and we really had a reiteration of the law from Exodus and this was for that second generation, the generation that was about to enter into the promised land. Um, and, and so we saw some great things. We saw in, in, in Exodus the Mosaic Covenant, which really, again, was the law for the land. And in Deuteronomy, it was a reiteration of, of that law, of that covenant um, for this generation, again, that had raised up in the time of, of during the wilderness and the Exodus, and were getting ready to go in to the land of promise. So that, that was kind of the Pentateuch, the first five books in a quick nutshell. And so now tonight we are going to move on and, and cover Joshua and Judges and Ruth and First and Second Samuel. And we're going to do this pretty quickly and just run through some things. So we move into, into the book of Joshua. And Joshua is really about conquest. It's about the land, the people that, that, that are coming into the promised land. They, they have to take this over and to and to rid the, that land of the peoples that had been living there. So um, we saw in, in last week that Moses actually was not able, because of sin, because of rebellion, was not able to go into the land of promise. Joshua was his successor. And we're going to read in Joshua chapter 1 now. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses aids, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give to them. To the Israelites, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. So all, over and over again throughout the narrative of scripture, they're going to reference the covenant that God made, the unconditional covenant. Remember the unconditional promises, no strings attached that God made to the people, um, that he would raise up a people, a land, and a worldwide blessing. And we're going to see that referenced over and over again. We move on with verse 7. It says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. So again, some language there that would reference and, and go back to the book of Deuteronomy, kind of a Shema statement that, that God has wanted there to teach the laws and, and to do those. And kind of a reiter reiterization of the Mosaic Covenant as well. We move on, it says, then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land that your, the Lord your God is giving, giving you for your own. So this is kind of a summary, that's really a summary of the book of Joshua. It's about conquest. It's all about the land. The people have come out of the Exodus. They've wandered in the wilderness and they're ready to get on into the land that God had promised to them. There are great stories in the book of Joshua that we're not going to have time to go into. We see Rahab and, and the spies. We get them to see a miraculous crossing of, of the Jordan. Right There's the battle of Jericho. So there's some great moments, but there's, there's also some difficult times in, 
in, in the book of Joshua. We see a couple times where there's a covenant renewal, where, where the law of Moses is read to them, and they said, we will, we will obey, we will follow. So they, they renew the Mosaic covenant. There's, a, there's this constant interchange that I mentioned of, of how God is going to work out his unconditional promises that he gave to Abraham. Remember, people, land, and a worldwide blessing, how he's going to work that out while at the same time this Mosaic covenant, which was a conditional covenant where the people said, I will obey. And remember, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that if the people obeyed in the land, if they followed the law in the land, then things would go well for them. But if they disobeyed, there would be curses. So again, this, this, this idea of a covenant renewal here where the people said, hey, we have heard what you have, what you have said to, to our people through Moses and, and we will follow that. So we get to chapter 24 and I just want to read a few verses from there just to show this, this covenant renewal. It says, then Joshua dismissed the people each to their own inheritance. And after these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who, who outlived him and who had experienced everything that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And, I, and I, again, I reference some of this because the story is unfolding, it's ongoing, and these books are connected one to another, and we, we know the history and, and how they relate to one another, we're able to understand things better. Verse 33, it says, Eleazar, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. So again, this book of Joshua is all about the land. The people that were in the wilderness, they, they head into the land of promise. And we see two covenant renewals throughout that book. And we're reminded of, of their blessings for following the law, the Mosaic Covenant and their curses um, when they did not adhere to that law. And then we're, we're going to move into Joshua. But again, um, there were some seeds that were planted in, in the book of, of Joshua. They, they followed God some of the times, but also we see a little bit of, of, of some seeds of rebellion. All right. And that, that, that are going to follow and, and really take root and, and grow in the book of, of Judges. But um, Judges, we cannot understand in, unless we keep in mind Deuteronomy chapter 28, which again, key chapters, key ideas that we keep referencing, that if they serve the Lord, if they follow the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the law, there will be blessings. But if they don't, if they decide to turn away from God and follow the, the land and the, and the people of these, these foreign nations and, and their gods, then there will be curses. So that sets the stage now for Joshua chapter one that I want to read. It says, after the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who of us is to go up first to fight against the Canaanites? So again, I want you to see there's a connection, right? There's this, this conquering that was to take place in the book of Joshua was not complete. So there's still some things um, to, to be taken care of and to be placed. And remember, the people in Joshua, they, they didn't necessarily follow. So this, this seed of unfaithfulness is now fully grown in, in the book of Judges. And we're going to see this pattern. So they start off with some additional conquering. And then we move to Judges Chapter 2 it says, The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. So again, God is kind of showing this relationship between the two covenants, right? There's the, again, the, and I know I keep repeating these things, but they're essential for understanding. There's the Abrahamic covenant that's unconditional, that God will fulfill no matter what. He cannot go back on his word. But then there's the Mosaic covenant, which is dependent upon some conditions. Will the people fulfill their part? And I guess to put that in play, I, I think I've mentioned how as parents, we love our children and we love them unconditionally. Again, I hope my kids understand that no matter what they do, no matter what road they head down, I, I will always love them. But with that said, there are also some, while they are in my house and, and under my supervision, there are some rules and regulations, and there are consequences if, if they disobey them. So there's that unconditional love, but then there's also a part of a relationship that is based upon some conditions. And I guess that's the best way I can explain this tension that's going on um, with the nation of Israel between these two different covenants. So we move to Joshua, I mean to Judges chapter 2, starting with verse 6. We're going to pick up there. It says, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. 
The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things that the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Harris in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. After that, the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. So these people that had come out of the wilderness, that had grown up in the wilderness and entered into the promised land where they started to conquest and, and to take over the land, now that generation is starting to die out. And we kind of get a haunting verse here in verse 10. It says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation who grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And, I, and again, the writer writes these things so that we take notice. And I think this is kind of a, a, a haunting turning point in the story. When you really think about it, we are only one generation removed from knowing the goodness of God in our life. See, we have a responsibility, as, as was mentioned in Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, to, to, to teach the next generation about our God and, and the wonderful life that he offers. So it's, it's haunting to, to think that so quickly a people had seen amazing things in the, the act of God in their life could, could one generation just basically turn away from him. So we start to see this downward spiral in, in the book of Judges, and it's painful. And there's some good stories. I mean, we read about Samson and Delilah, um, but most of the stories are, are negative. Things, you know, things aren't going the way that they're supposed to be. Deuteronomy 28 is being played out. And we see this, this, um, this pattern that I'm going to give a little an, an acronym to, and it's called SWORD. And what we see is the people sin. In other words, they don't play their part in, in the covenant with God, and they reject him, and they, they disobey him, and, and they really turn their hearts toward foreign gods. So we see this sin. And then because of that, and because of what God had said in Deuteronomy 28, that there will be curses for not following the law, for not uh, uh, obeying their, their aspect, their, their portion, there's oppression. And so foreign invaders would come, and, and the land would not produce, and famines and droughts and things just wouldn't go well then there's the r and and the people would repent they would repent of the unfaithfulness that they they had towards the mosaic covenant and they, after they turned and worshiped other gods and and they would see that hey we need to turn back to god and so then they would repent and turn back to god and then god would raise up a deliverer a judge he would use a person to to bring the nation of israel back to prominence and you would think that they would learn their lesson but then the pattern would continue and they would turn away and they would go towards sin and oppression and then they would repent and then god would raise up a judge so a cycle that's vicious that's not that, that's not helpful that's not that's not leading them to be the people that that god desires for them to be then we get to judges chapter 21 and i'm not sure what they've They've gotten the notes, but um, I'm going to read it from the English stan Standard Version. And this is Joshua, Judges chapter 21, verse 25. And it said, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, there was no leadership, no direction. The people had forgotten the great deeds of, uh, of, of, of God, and they had turned to other gods. And again, we saw those patterns over and over again. People were doing whatever they wanted, what was right in their own eyes. And again, we see this tension. How is God going to fulfill his promises when the people continue to rebel against him? How, how is God going to, to unconditionally do what he has promised to do when the people are in constant rebellion and constant turmoil? So there's, there's Joshua and Judges, and then we have this short little book called Ruth, and, and it almost seems to be wedged into the story of the Old Testament, almost a little strange. And really, the book of Ruth is a love story. And, and there's a couple connections that we want to see and why I think this continues in our narrative of the story, you know, and, and we'll just run through it real quickly. But in verse 1, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. So in other words, um, we have a verse here that's just, you know, is pregnant with information. This was during the days of the judges. There's a famine in the land. So what do you think is going on? Knowing what we understand from Deuteronomy chapter 28, do you think the people are following God or not following God? We, we know that, that they're not following God. They've turned towards other gods. They've turned towards the false gods. They've gone their own way. And now they're in one of these cycles, these down cycles, where they're, where they're paying the price for that. Right? That, that sword acronym is coming into play. It's the fruit of their disobedience. And it's kind of funny here because the word Bethlehem, 
means house of bread. And yet I think the author's playing here because there's no bread in the land because of their unfaithful covenant relationship. So they leave the, the promised land that God had given to them and they, they go to the enemy, enemy territory into the land of Moab. And so the reader, the, the Israelite reader of, of this would, would understand this is a horrible situation. Verse 2 says that the man's name was Elimelech. And that, that word, which, which names had meanings um, back in that time much more so than what they do today, but the, the word Elimelech means God is my king. So God was his king back in his country, but, but God's punishing the people. They're, 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 he's fulfilling the, the, the Mosaic covenant, the curses that are coming from this. And, and so the people now are heading to the enemy territory. And there's nothing good about this situation. We continue on. It says, Elimelech's wife's name was Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. So it continues to get worse. Verse 3, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband died. How much more can they take? There's a famine. They're, they're moving into enemy territory. Now Elimelech dies. And, and in the ancient Near East, this is, this is horrible news. She's now alone, but, but at least she has a couple of sons. And the author's kind of leading us and kind of playing with us a little bit. And we continue on. And she was left with her two sons. Verse 4, it said, they married Moabite women. One named Orpah and the other Ruth. Just keeps declining and spiraling downwards. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malin and Killian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So now this, this Israelite woman has, has gone to a, a foreign land. She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. This is a brutal situation. She's on her own. Verse 6, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. Again, knowing what we know from Deuteronomy 28, things are starting to look up. God is working. He's probably bought a judge and, and a deliverer after the people have repented. So they're able to head back um, towards, towards their homeland. Verse, we're going to skip forward to, to verse 16 now. It says, Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Because basically, Naomi has said, you can, you can stay in your country. I'm going to head back. I have nothing for you. But moves on it says don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you where you go i will go and where you stay i will stay your people will be my people and your god my god where you die i will die and there i will be buried may the lord deal with me be it ever so severely if even death separates you and me don't call me naomi she she told them call me mara because the almighty has made my life very bitter that word means bitter i went away full but the lord has brought me back empty why call me naomi the Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Then, then it, it goes, and, and we're told that, that Ruth goes out, and she's, they're, they're probably poor, and she goes out and gleans some leftover grain in the fields, and, and this is, we could read about this, this was kind of a welfare system that God had established for the nation of Israel. We turn to chap Ruth chapter 2, verse 1, and it says, As it turned out, and again, the author is, is again, I think, playing with this. As it turned out, um, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. And again, this wasn't just a coincidence. The author's bringing us to a place. This is the providence of God. And we could read on and on and about this story, and we see how, how Ruth ends up falling in love, and there's this idea of kinsmen, redeemers, and things that, that we won't get into. But one point that I wanted to make is, is several times in the short book, Ruth, remember this foreign woman, is called Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth the Moabitess. And it's almost like the author is wanting to remind us that, that this is the kind of faithfulness that God is, is wanting from his people. And yet in the time of the judges, there was this, this unfaithfulness and this crazy cycle that the people were on. And so I think the author is showing us that, hey, God is always looking for obedience and for people that are following him. And, and we're reminded over and over again, what God is wanting from his people is actually found from this foreign woman. In this, we're going to turn to Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. And the woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will re renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. 
He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And then we get this genealogy that I just want to run through real quick. It says the genealogy of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashan. Nashan, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. Okay, so a couple things in this book that seems to be sandwiched in there. We get a, a, a picture of faithfulness and love that God desires from his people that, that, that weren't really following that at that time. And we also see a link to this King David that we are going to move into now as we move into to First and Second Samuel and kind of the time of the kings. Right? So in First Samuel, we see a lot of things. And really, there's a man in, in this book called Samuel. And Samuel is kind of the first one of the, really the prophets that we get to see. And, um, and, and he's referenced in the Kings, and, and he's kind of the, the epitome of this prophetic line that's opening up. And we'll get into more of that over the, the next few weeks as we talk about the prophets and how they relate to this story and this narrative of Scripture. But I really want to read in, um, in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, because really we're, we're seeing this, this ongoing story and some problems. And, and these are referred to um, as, as kind of the, the arc portion uh, of this of these this book of of first and second Samuel, but first um, Samuel chapter four it says now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines, and the Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel is defeated by the Philistines, who killed about four thousand of them on the battlefield. And remember Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight. We need to read this and. In, in, with that thought in mind, so things, they, they must be disobeying God here because they're losing. Verse 3, when the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the, Israel, before the Philistines? And see, we know from reading the scriptures, have you not paid attention to what Moses has said, what Joshua has said, what God has said to you through these people that he's raised up? We know why they lost. They lost because they're not following God. I mean, are, are, we almost want to say, are you clueless at this point? We move on. It says, let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people at that time, the, the ark of the covenant that these chapters are about um, are, is a symbol of God's presence. And, and I think what we're starting to see here is that the people started to put trust in the things of God rather than, than God himself. Kind of a form of idolatry. So they're not really serving God. They've almost become superstitious. If we have these relics, if we have this, the Ark of the Covenant, that's really where our power comes from. And it's almost like Indiana Jones. But that we know that that's not it. It's actually God who is, who is working on their behalf. So the people, in a way, are, are committing idolatry even with some, some good things. So verse 4, it says, So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, What's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. They were afraid of this, this relic, this symbol of God's presence. A God has come into the camp, they said. Again, their, their pagan superstition, thinking that this Ark, that this, you know, this, this man-made thing um, actually had any power. They said, oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to, to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines, the enemies of, of the people of God, the enemies of Israel, it said the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers, 30,000 people. And the ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Again, I would argue, and if you read this, you're going to just see the disobedience of the people. They, they, they are disobeying the covenant that they had made with God and there's, there's a price to pay for this, this conditional covenant. And they, they, had, they had really you know, prostituted themselves against God and and put their faith in, in, again, the things of God rather than God himself. So we move on, and now we move to, to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And this is a key chapter, in it, and it's really a dividing line now as we head into the times of the kings. So I want to read 1 Samuel chapter 8. It says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. 
The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So again, Samuel, this, this, this prophet of God that we see the first in kind of the line of prophets, his sons don't, don't continue to follow in his ways. Verse 4, so all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. In other words, this is almost like, like a little kid. Saying, look around. Now, again, you got to think in context. What has God done for these? I mean, they're only a generation, you know, a, a short time removed from all the miracles. From They had heard the stories of what God had done in the wilderness, how he had provided for them, how he had fought battles for them. And yet they say the very things that, that again, we've, we've probably glanced over and skipped over, but we read about in Deuteronomy and different things that they, they've totally disobeyed. And they followed the ways of, of the peoples around them. They, they've turned their back on God. They're almost like a little kid. Everybody else is doing it. I want to do it. And yet, you know, the, these people in, in the Pentateuch that we've read through, they were called to be a kingdom of priests. They were called to be God's people, and, and God was to be their king, but they said that's not good enough for us. We don't trust him, so we want to be like the other nations, and, and we want our own king. Right? Verse 6, it says, when they said, then, but when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel, Samuel who who had followed God and knew God's promises. It says, so he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not that you have they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. God says, Samuel, you don't feel bad. I am the one that they've turned their back on, that they've cheated on. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemn, solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some will be assigned to be commanders of thousands and commanders of 50 and others to plow his ground and, and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. And when that day comes, you will cry out relief for relief from the king that you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. So at this point, the people should have said, man, maybe we should have stuck with this original plan. God's warning them, saying, I'm going to give you what you want, but it's going to come back to haunt you. You had a good situation. I'm your God. I've made you promises. You would just listen and obey if you would follow what, you know, you're part of this, this Mosaic covenant and things would go well. But it says the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations. Do you see the problem? They're turning their back on the one true God, the covenant God, the creator God. We want to be like the other nations with the king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. Now remember, they had always miraculously won when they were obeying God and he was doing his job. So when Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. And the Lord answered and said, listen to him. Give him a king. Let them see what they're gonna, what's going to happen. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. So we know then as we, as we follow the story that, that Saul's the first king. And that didn't work out very well. Saul was chosen by the people. He was tall, dark, and handsome. He had all the attributes that you would think you would want in a king. He seemed to have it all. And the people chose him. And it started off pretty good. It started off where, where Saul was humble, but eventually the story radically turns, and, and then we're introduced to King David. And again, I would encourage you to come back and read this story. But God rejects Saul, the, the king that the people had chosen, and he, and he designates David as king. And there's a great story about how um, it's time for God to pick the king, and, and men are, the, the brothers of David are paraded before him, and, and he says, no, 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 and the people are surprised, and Finally, there's one, one left, one son of, of Jesse left, and, and that's David. And he's a, a shepherd boy, and he's out in the fields, and God says, bring him to me. See, I don't look at the things that man looks at. I, I, I know what I want, and other people saw a shepherd boy, and, and God saw a king. 
So David, we see, is a, is a great musician. He's a poet. He's an artist. He's a writer. He's a singer. He's a dreamer. I mean, he is, he is talented. He's a great warrior. But Saul, on the other hand, he goes insane. And he tries to kill David numerous times. And, and Saul dies, and eventually David comes onto the scene as, as God's anointed king. Right? But the desire and, and the heartbeat um, for the people is, is, is really for their king rather than, than, than God's king. They had chosen Saul, and, and David, again, was chosen by God. But God's working in the mess, as he always does, and he's not afraid of the mess. And, and that's where he does his, his great work. Right? I mean, Jesus came onto the scene. So while things seem to be all haywire and all messed up, God is working. God's had his plan. And, and it says that David was a man after God's own heart. And as we read stories of David, he did great things and he was passionate about God, but we also know that he sinned greatly. And it was messed up. And, and we see, and I think I mentioned it in, in week two, that, that the difference between really Saul and David was when Saul was confronted with his sins, he made excuses and put the blame on other people. And David was confronted with his great sin, he repented, and he turned to God. But this is, this is a huge thing now that this, this king comes onto the scene. Passionate worship, um, great courage. I mean, he's killed a lion and a bear, and, and we're going to start to see how God starts to work in the life of David to point to something greater that is coming, coming greater. And so, so David is chosen by God. He's the anointed king. And we start to read about this covenant that God starts to make with David. And, and again, now we're in a situation with the nation of Israel where the Ark of, covenant, the, Ark of the Covenant is actually back, back among the people. David's on the throne. God is blessing the nation of Israel. They're being led by a great king, and things are looking up. And we're going to read now in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And this is, if, if you're reading in your Bible, it's got a little heading that this is God's promise to David. So starting with, verse, uh, with, with chapter 7, verse 1. It says, after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. He said, and again, Deuteronomy chapter 28. They're being blessed at this time. He said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. In other words, David says, I'm living in my palace. Now all the buildings um, in Israel, they're all made of stone. Still, we could, we could go and look at the ruins today made of stone. But what David says, is, my house that's made of stone is lined with cedar. I'm living in luxury. Things are going well, <clears throat> and yet there's no place for, for our God to, resi to reside. There's, there's nothing like what I have for our God. Verse 3, <clears throat> Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, in other words, God says, Hey, Nathan, maybe you spoke a little too soon. Retract that statement. This is what he says in verse 5. God says to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I haven't dwelt in the house from the day that I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. In other words, what he's saying is, hey, David, I'm God. I mean, there's not a house big enough for me. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't need this house. And, and they're going to continue to repeat this word house over and over again. Again, because the author knows what he's doing. He's leading us somewhere. Verse 7, this is God still speaking. It says, wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture. He reminds David of, of where he came from. I took you from the pasture. You were a young shepherd boy from tending the flock and, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. In other words, he makes this historical statement over David. Remember what I've done. He says, I've been with you wherever you've gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great. And again, are we starting to see some of this, this covenant language? Where have we heard that before? It kind of reminds us to go back to the promises God made to Abraham. He says, I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did in the beginning and have done ever since I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. Kind of again, reminding, now that we know, reminding us of Genesis 12. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. In other words, he says, David, you came into this conversation 
and you wanted to build a house for me. He says, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn the tables and I'm going to establish a house for you. And now we get into to a, 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 a pretty key part of the rest of Scripture, especially when we get to the New Testament of how this relates to our King, Jesus. So this house that David spoke of, this physical house that he wanted to build for God, God turns now and kind of uses the same words and, and he moves it from a physical house to a people. Verse 12, he says, When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. In other words, he says, God says, well, David, when you're gone, I'm, you're going to have a son, and we know the son, and we'll look into it more next week, King Solomon. And, 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 and David, you want to build the house. You're not going to do it for a variety of reasons that the scripture talks about, but, but God says, you know, your son will build that house. He'll be from your lineage, and, and, and he'll build the house that you wanted to build for me. And then verse 13 says, he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. And now we're starting to see kind of a, a little shift. Forever language. I mean, he's talking about David's son, Solomon, but he's saying there's going to be a king that reigns forever. Verse 14, it says, I will be his father and, and he will be my son. And so he starts to use this adoption type language. And it's really the first time that this is used in, in reference to a physical king who will reign on planet earth that kind of represents God, his, his reigning regent. He will be my son. He will be my representative. He will be my king. And it's kind of a twist because, again, David says, I'll build your temple, but God says, we've got something greater to talk about, David. You want to build a temple, but your house, your, your son is going to build that house for my name, but, but there is a kingdom coming through that will be a kingdom that will last forever this adoptive language, and, and starts to plant the seeds of a, of, of, of a son who would, who would be the reigning regent on earth for a kingdom that will never end. We continue on. Verse 14, when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul. So while this king, not the future king that will fulfill this, but while these kings that, that represent God will will screw up and mess up. God will never take the love away. This is, again, now we went from an Abrahamic covenant that was unconditional to a Mosaic that was conditional, and now we're talking about the Davidic um, covenant that, again, is unconditional. God says, no matter how they act, I'm going to continue, and there will be a king in this line through you, David, that will reign forever, that will be my son. Verse 16 says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then King David went in and sat before the throne and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me thus far? And as, and as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. In other words, he says, Wow. What a revelation. David understands that this promise is for something that's, that's far down the line. This is an eternal kingdom. This is permanent. This is forever language. And David understands this as a far future. So the, the, the components of this Davidic covenant that we see about with this language that God gives is that, that he's going to, to give David a house through his seed. In other words, it's going to be through his line from the genealogical line of King David, who is a son of Abraham. So it even goes back and relates to Genesis chapter 12. And he says, and I'm going to give you a kingdom. So a house, a seed, and a kingdom. And again, we're going to see when we get to the New Testament how this starts to play out and, and how God does this. But this is important language now. Now we're starting to have some, some messianic language, right? This claim of, of God's anointed one who will sit on a throne forever. And this is the beginning of, a, of the promise that's, that's, that's a little shaded here, right? Where it's, it's kind, of, kind of hidden a little bit, but God is starting to reveal things. It's the beginning of a promise, again, of a physical reigning Messiah. Messiah of Israel, a, a kingdom that will be established forever. And, and he uses adoptive language. He will be my son that sits on the throne. And this ties back even to, to Genesis chapter 12, how God will one day bless the entire world. So we're starting to see how these, he's fulfilling these promises. A house, a promised seed, a kingdom that will last forever. And again, still shrouded, 
We're going to start to get glimpses. We, we don't totally understand that at this point what God was pointing towards. But this is unconditional language. God says, this is what I'm going to do. And this language ties us back with these other covenants that we've been learning about and, and that God is always faithful to his word. He's starting to talk about a Messiah that was to come that has a specific role in a, in a position and, and who will be the son of God. There will be a, 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 a one from the line of King David that will endure forever. And if we get to the New Testament, right, and, and, and we're, we're running short on time, so um, I'll save some of these other things for, for next week, but I, I just want us to understand that that, that language that's a little shrouded, this covenant that God makes with David, that you'll have a house, that you're going to have a seed that, that sits on the line, a king that, that, in a, that will reign in a kingdom forever. We see that this is actually played out when we get to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 22. Um, and, and again, I'm not going to read it, but, but there, there are all kinds of psalms and there are all kinds of references that we're going to learn about over these upcoming weeks that, that point to this king that is coming. And we read in, in Matthew 22, um, Jesus says that, hey, all those things, all those kind of veiled, hidden references, those things that were starting to unfold, this idea of a son, this idea of, of, a, of, a, of the line of David establishing a kingdom that will, that will last forever, all those things were pointing towards me. And see, when we get to the New Testament, we'll see over and over again where, where Jesus was speaking to people, and he said that Moses and the prophets what they wrote to the people of their day, they were actually writing about Jesus himself. So it's just an amazing, an amazing uh, way that the story is starting to unfold. And at every step of the way, the anticipation should be building. How is God going to fulfill his covenant with Abraham in the midst of the rebellion and the people not fulfilling their part of the Mosaic covenant? And then God comes onto the scene. How is he going to bless the world? And God brings David in this kingly line. And he says, something is coming that you couldn't even dream of. And even when we get to the time of Jesus in the New Testament, many of the Jewish people, they were looking for a Messiah and for a king that, that didn't fit the description of Jesus, which we're going to see unfold throughout the Old Testament and be perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ, all the promises of God through that. So we're going to get the privilege of seeing this story unfold, and it continues. And, and, and so now we've gone really through, through three covenants. We've had the unconditional Abrahamic covenant, right, about a people, a land, and a worldwide blessing. We've had the, the law for the land, the Mosaic covenant, that was conditional. If the people obeyed, they were blessed. If they, if they didn't, they were cursed. And, and, and there's a tension there. How is that all going to work out? And now we get the Davidic covenant, where God is starting to show us how he is going to bless the whole world. And it's going to be through a great king, a king like no other, a king that will reign forever. Something is up. Don't know exactly what it is at this point in the story. But something is coming that's bigger and greater than we can all imagine. And again, we have the advantage. I'm sitting here in the auditorium and I'm looking at the back wall and it's saying it's all about Jesus. And we have the advantage of seeing it from our vantage point, how Jesus fulfilled all of this and how God's plan is perfect and amazing as it unfolds. But as we see this background, the story of Scripture, the story from Genesis to Revelation starts to make more and more sense. And Jesus, the story of him, the gospel message, the good news of Jesus fits into the panorama of Scripture perfectly and, and just is an amazing, amazing plan that God had that no human could write. This is the story of God um, with, uh, given to us by revelation through, our, through the Word, through the Bible. So uh, I hope this just kind of whets your appetite. We'll touch more on this and review a little bit more of this next week. Um, but now we're, we're in the time of Kings. We're going to start looking at some, some other books that go along with this and those sections that we needed to drop into the history section. We'll talk more about those, talk about Solomon, a little bit more about King David. Um, but, but again, hopefully you're seeing these promises and how and, and you're linking it together and seeing how Jesus starts to fulfill these as, as we, we get the story unfolded. So I want to go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, just uh, thank you. Thank you that, that you're a good God. Thank you that, you that you love us so much. Father, we see even in the SWORD acronym how often uh, we turn our backs on you and how you could have given up and you could have... You could have just said, nope, this is the last straw, but you are always true to your word. And you've made a promise that you're going to create a people, that you're going to give them a land, that you are going to, 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 to have a worldwide blessing through the seed of Abraham, who a great king will come onto the scene. 
And sure, there are blessings for when we follow you, and, and there are consequences when we don't. But, but fortunately, God, um, it all ultimately rests on you and your faithfulness and your promises because we need a Savior. We need a king who can take care of the sin problem that we have, that we are helpless to, to, to do anything about. But we thank you for your plan. We thank you for your amazing love. And give us a hunger and a desire to learn more about you so that our friendship and our relationship with you can grow in, in mighty ways to be more and more loving and so that we can love you more and go out and love people and be a light for the world and point people towards you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. See you guys next week.